This episode is brought to you by Vanguard Wellness. Vanguard Wellness supports Canadian military veterans as they navigate their journey through psychedelic therapy to overcome PTSD and depression. I've personally gone through the treatment and I've had great success. As a veteran Vanguard, we can help those who suffer by providing education, guidance and support to ensure you have the most successful journey possible. Mental health isn't black and white, so why should your treatment be? Connect with us today at vanguardwellness.ca. Hi, I'm Trevor. And I'm Amy. Thank you for joining us on the Pathways to Healing podcast. Pathways to Healing is a podcast that showcases new and emerging therapies like psychedelic assisted therapy and other effective strategies that allow you to heal and live a more fulfilled life. Many of us have or will suffer from mental illness at some points in our lives. This is especially true in the veteran and first responder communities. From PTSD, depression, anxiety, and addiction, there are alternative therapies available. This is the Pathways to Healing podcast. On today's episode, we have the pleasure of speaking to Dennis McKenna. Dennis is an ethnopharmacologist and has been conducting research in his field for over 40 years. He's a popular guest speaker, university lecturer, and has appeared in several documentaries. He's also written several books and has spent a lot of time in the Amazon rainforest. He is the principal founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy and a founding member at the Hefter Research Institute. Dennis is extremely knowledgeable and the perfect person to walk us through an explanation of psychedelics from a pharmacological perspective. You know, psychedelics are a class of psychoactive drugs that, that, you know, include things like LSD and psilocybin and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, all right. Well, those are kind of the main ones, and then things like ibogaine, and I well, ayahuasca is a psychedelic. Uh, you can talk about these things in terms of uh, uh, you know their origins, like their plant origins and that sort of thing, or their roles in indigenous cultures. Mm-hmm. Or you can talk about it in a more nuts and bolts sense about their pharmacology, their chemistry, and so on. So uh, LSD, MD, uh, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, uh, uh, these sorts of things all work on a certain subset of serotonin receptors in the brain called the 5-HT2A receptors. And uh, that's what they have in common pharmacologically. And that's why a lot of the experiences are very similar. And yet there's structural differences. There's differences in, you know, the way that they bind to the receptors and so on. So it makes it different. Ketamine and MDMA are not really psychedelics in the, strict way that I like to define psychedelics. Okay. That's I'm not imposing that on anybody else. It's it's just a way to categorize these things. And I say psychedelics, true psychedelics, are uh serotonin two A receptor, uh two A agonists. They they target these specific subset of serotonin receptors called the two A receptors. And they're agonists. And in pharmacology that means when it binds to a receptor, it actually does something Mm -hmm. (laughs) as opposed to an antagonist, which just kind of sits there and blocks the neurotransmitter that might be binding. Now, MDMA doesn't work that way quite, and ketamine doesn't work quite that way either. It works on another set of receptors in the brain called the NMDA receptors, Mm -hmm. not to be confused with the MDMA receptors. (laughs) You know, we got alphabet soup going on here, but the (laughs) NMDA uh, receptors, the N-methyl D-aspartate receptors, uh, is a wholly different target than the psychedelics, yet the effects of ketamine are very similar to psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to go into the neuropharmacology of it other than to say that 
the effect is very similar. And, and, and downstream, some of the things that uh, ketamine does triggers the same kind of molecular responses that the true psychedelics do. Yep. Now, MDMA is a whole different kettle of fish in a certain way. It works on serotonin like the true psychedelics, but it doesn't work on these receptors. It actually works on the so-called serotonin transporters in the brain, the same uh, mechanisms that the SSRIs work on. The SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, uh, prevent serotonin once it's released into the synapse from being uptaken. And so that, that helps, that brings about the feelings of euphoria, or that helps bring about the, the antidepressant effects. MDMA works on those transporters as well, but in the opposite way. If the SSRIs jams the uptake inhibitors so that they can't uptake serotonin, MDMA throws them open. MDMA causes all the serotonin to leak out. <laughs> so it has it has the the more or less opposite effect. And the effect on the on the whole brain is that your brain is flooded with serotonin. So your brain and serotonin is the feel good chemical, right? That's mm-hmm. why you yep. have euphoria and feel love and feel suffused with, you know, all these emotional effects that are very valuable for and for trauma and that sort of thing. That's probably more pharmacology than you really wanted here, but that's that there are there are similar differences, I think, uh, and similarities and differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, therapeutically, I think what the psychedelics do is they, no matter what the neurochemical mechanisms are at work, uh, what they do is they help you step out of your reference frame temporarily, mm-hmm. you know, and, yeah. and the neuroscientists, they call that the, uh, the default mode network uh, mm-hmm. is, is the term for it. But your reference frame is the, the mechanisms that your brain sets up to effect, effectively let you navigate in what we call consensus reality. In other words, ordinary day-to-day consciousness and what the brain does a lot to create this uh, this this default me- default mode network, this this uh, framework of reality, you will, because the brain synthesizes reality essentially, mm-hmm. and that's very useful because it lets us navigate through the world, open a can of tuna fish, drive cars, do all the things that we have to do to be engaged. But it also prevents many things from getting through. The brain is a filter as much as it is, as it is a gateway. And these selective filtering mechanisms are, uh, you know, it, it's useful for day-to-day functioning, ordinary functioning to filter out certain things. But it's also useful to disable that temporarily. And that's what psychedelics do. That's why it's so important when you do psychedelics to pay attention to set and setting, right? Because you don't want to have to work, worry about maintaining reality. You know, you do not want to be confronted with having to drive a car or answer the telephone or, you know, a knock on the door, these sorts of things. You want to be able to focus on the inner uh, processes that are going on. This, these, these key variables called set and setting. And so that's why, uh, you know, the, 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 the circumstances of the therapy, whether that takes place in a clinic or whether that takes place in a hot in the Amazon uh, or some something in between, you know, a, a, a living room in Marin or whatever. But the important thing is that the set and setting is as important as the pharmacology here or as the substance. It's yeah. the... It's the setting in which you take it. And the set is what you bring to it, essentially. I mean, more than just your intention, it's really everything you are. You know, your past experiences, your expectations, your memories, your associations, all of that's the set. The set defines you. 
you know, the, your mindset, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so these are important variables to, to make a psychedelic, uh, you know, uh, not only enjoyable and pleasant, but also therapeutically uh, useful. It's really interesting to think of psychedelic compounds being used as medicine. After decades of programming, many people will first need a shift in their paradigm to accept this concept. And I'm really hopeful that there will be more public support as time goes on. Yeah, there's definitely been an increase over the last 10 years. I know when I started researching new treatments for PTSD in 2014, you had to dig really deep to find any information on psychedelic assisted therapy. Now it seems like there's a new article every day. Well, the research is pretty compelling, and Dennis explains it very well. He says, the healing happens because psychedelics allows you to temporarily step outside your regular thought patterns and process difficult experiences. Psychedelics can generate new pathways in the brain and the effects can be long lasting, even years. I know antidepressants can be helpful and definitely necessary for some people, but psychedelics are really the next level for healing because you can completely change your perspective even after a few sessions. Well, I think, I mean, my experience, I think, echoes a lot of people, uh, the experiences that you've had. I uh, have been lucky in the sense that I've never been in the military or any situation that's put me in trauma, traumatic situations. So I would say I have PTSD, but, you know, everybody has their challenges. And I, I think, I think, uh, uh, everyone can benefit or most people from benefit. And, and the basic thing is that it lets you step out of, outside your reference frame, as I said, to look at your situation from a different perspective. And in some ways, that's what trauma and depression and addiction and all of these things that uh, psychedelics seem so useful uh, to, to alleviate, they are examples of, uh, uh, you know, the, the traps that we make for ourselves, you know, the, the, the patterns of habitual behavior and thinking that we just can't get out of. And so this temporary disruption of these habitual behaviors, this default mode network can be very useful for getting a new perspective, you know, on the situation. It's good to just blow it up. You know, because it's going to fall back. It's going to come together. It's very resilient, mm -hmm. but it's it's literally like rebooting your computer. I think there's a lot to, I think it's an accurate analogy. You know, you, you run your computer a certain time and it gets kludgy and you get errors, and this sort of thing. You just restart the damn thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. it comes back. It reconstitutes itself. And that's very much the way the default mode network does. But a lot of the uh, a lot of the glitches that have accumulated over time are not there. So you run smoothly, you know, mm -hmm. runs more smoothly. And you have this sense of uh, renewal and like a fresh perspective and and that sort of thing, and I think that's that's where the benefit is. That that's why they're so useful because so many of these things are, you know, linked to to uh, essentially habitual behaviors or or disturbing memories and that sort of thing that you just can't get away from. Yeah. You know, so you need a little boost. You need to blow it up so it can fall back together in a more in a more coherent way. Yeah, I can truly, uh, I can say when I, when I do uh, psychedelics, that's exactly how I feel. Um, I use them when I am, you know, clogged up and I just can't get, I can't get normal. And, and, and I just, I have, I take the psychedelics and honestly, yeah, you're right. It's like a reboot and a, and a yeah. reset on my life. And it just, I just feel so much more open and available. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's like it does reconstitute itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the brain, you know, is very resilient, uh, and these systems, these these uh, systems of homeostatic feedback mechanisms that keep everything in equilibrium, you know, you've got a strong uh, tendency to that. So yeah. it's 
So really, it's okay to disrupt them because it's going to, you know, it's, it's going to come back together in a, in a much, uh, much better way. You know, uh, I mean, usually it does. Of course, there's always the, the uh, small number of people that it doesn't reconstitute. Yeah, but that's <laughs> like anything. Come back together. That's like anything, but though, right? That's very rare. Yeah, that, that happens. Yeah. And you right. also want to create some new pathways, right? Like you want you want to disrupt totally. it. You want to blow up what you had, those patterns, those cycles that you couldn't get out of. But I guess the hard work really comes in when you have to develop new habits, new new ways of thinking, and uh, mm-hmm. sort of create those new pathways, right? So that's that's where the hard work comes in. Mm-hmm. That's right. And new pathways is exactly the right word because what we now understand about psychedelics is they actually do generate new pathways. They, they stimulate uh, neurogenesis, which is the growth of, of nerves, and they stimulate synaptogenesis, which is the, the formation of synapses. So this is, uh, uh, th- this is exactly right. You, you, you know, what you experience after the session, that's sort of in terms of the therapeutic benefits and you feel you know, better, you feel more engaged with the world and, and less troubled by these things. That's reflected by processes on the neurochemical, neuropharmacological level. Your your brain architecture actually can reorganize itself. And uh, this is this is well established now. This has been studied uh, and and this is what's going on. So it, you know, back uh, not too many years ago, 20 years ago or a little bit longer, the conventional wisdom was that once you had a particular complement of neurons in, in your brain at birth, it was downhill from there. You know, nerve cells died, but mm-hmm. they never came back. And that's not what's happening. We now understand that the brain is a very, uh, well, the term is neuroplastic. It yep. can, it has neuroplasticity. It can yep. change in response to environmental uh, stimuli of all kinds. And, and if it's bad stimulus, you know, like abuse or torture or something like that, it can, it's actually as a protective medicine, that's going to start to shut down these neural pathways and the psychedelics have the opposite effect, where it can actually stimulate the formation of new neural pathways. That is reflected on the behavioral and experimental level, you know, as as the healing process and changing habits, changing perspectives. This is why the uh, the antidepressant, anxiolytic, anti trauma, uh, all of these effects of psychedelics are are long lasting. You know, uh, unlike uh, antidepressants and that sort of thing, because one or two uh, well structured sessions, and then that can be reflected for weeks or months or years in the adaptive changes that this that this triggers. You know, so that's why these uh, these psychedelics are so promising compared to the conventional. Uh, uh, you know, psychopharmaceuticals like uh, like antidepressants, and I might add, so terrifying to the pharmaceutical industry. You yes. know, because these these are things that you might take a few times in your life. Yeah. You know, rather than every day for the rest of your life, and that's their revenue model. That doesn't apply to psychedelics. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, I've been preaching that one for a while, and, uh, and yeah, I, it's it's just so easy to see, like. It's right in front of you. Like if, if obviously they're there to make you feel well, not make you better. And uh, right, yeah, it's right. just bad they, business. They're they're band aids essentially, yeah, and yeah. and psychedelics let you get to the root of it and fix the problem. Yeah, I agree. I know this topic is something I wanted to talk to Dennis about. Does it matter if people seek their healing in ceremonial or clinical environments? So let me ask you, as a listener, would you be comfortable traveling to another place like Peru and taking psychedelics with people you don't know? Or would you prefer a clinic closer to home being monitored by medical devices and medical staff in a facility? 
there's many, many strong opinions on this. I think both are good approaches and whatever works for people. And I think actually a combination of ceremonial and more or less clinical type approaches yeah. are, is actually a better a better thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, both are fine. Both have in common that you do it in a structured setting. Yeah. That's that's why this set and setting variable is so so important. You know, because you have to do it in a place where number one, you feel safe. Mm -hmm. You know, number two, you know that the people that are helping uh, guide the session. Uh, you know, are, are can be trusted yep. and have your best interests at heart and are yep. not out to, you know, cause problems. And, and sometimes that comes up in, in the, in the tourist situation. I mean, not all shamans are good people. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there is a lot of, uh, abuse particularly sexual abuse and other kinds of things but i don't think it's i don't think it's prevalent i actually think it's rare and i think that but it does happen mm -hmm. and it gives the whole the whole thing kind of a bad reputation yeah. many shamans or curanderos or whatever the word is they're really doing it because they're healers and they do want to help people i think where we're headed is to do, what i would like to see is a combination of the best in clinical practices combined with the best in ceremonial practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see this with, uh, you know, even with the clinical studies with uh, MDMA and psilocybin and so on, I mean, they're clinical, they're done at hospitals. The people around you are clinicians, you know, but they're not wearing white coats, right. you know, and they're, you're doing it in a nice setting with some candles, and maybe some music and that sort of thing. So I, I tell people often, I uh, say, you know, ayahuasca is a liquid. Ayahuasca will fill any vessel that you want to put it in. Yeah. You know, so if it's a traditional ceremony in, in the Amazon or in the Sacred Valley, as long as the setting is thoughtfully done and the people are trustworthy and, and, the, and you feel like it's a safe place, that's fine. You know, or if it's a, you know, somebody's living room in in berlin or new york that's probably okay yep. underneath a subway in a room in brooklyn probably not so much you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so you just have to pay attention to these things but there is no one way to do this mm -hmm. you know and uh and, uh, you know, another aspect of that is that there's no one way to do it because the psychedelic experience at the end of the day is between you and the medicine. Right. You know, and it's an intensely personal experience. Nobody can have your psychedelic experience mm -hmm. for you, but they can help you facilitate the circumstances so that you can have the best experience that you can have that's unique to yourself. You know, yeah. that's what it is. Psychedelics quintessentially is a, is a journey of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, uh, you know, the good clinicians, the, the skilled clinicians and curanderos are there to uh, let that happen, to yeah. facilitate that, mm -hmm. not, not control it, you know, to exert control only to the extent, you know, that they not not to try to take over your experience, but they can help you, you know, through the rough spots yep. and using music and and uh, you know in in the Amazon fumigation and and uh, you know and that sort of thing using the ikaros the songs yeah. uh, and all of this is part of a well structured set and setting. Yeah, I agree, and I and I you know. I don't know if you've heard of Field Trip Health. Um, you probably have. They, they, they provide ketamine therapy right now. And what these are one of the things that I, I've preached to them is uh, the more that you can bring in ceremonial-wise going into the journey, uh, I, I personally believe the better, the better trip you're going to get and the, and yeah. the more healing. Um, to the point where I've actually asked them when I was going through my sessions there to smudge me in because... I don't mm -hmm. know what it is about being smudged in. I think it's, you know, it is a part of the ceremony. Uh, I love the smell of it. It just really brings me where I need to be. 
for that right. moment. So I completely understand. Yeah. Yeah. And you're used to that ceremonial setting. So mm-hmm. the smudging, you know, is a great way to get your, get your attention focused, yeah. find your center. It makes you feel purified and cleansed. So then you just get calmed down and you find your center. And yes. there are other ways you could do it. Some people might want to, might want to meditate for 10 minutes mm-hmm. or, you know, or listen to some, uh, like singing bowls and that kind of thing. There are all sorts of ways, yep. but I totally agree with you that the ceremonial uh, elements are, are not, uh, you know, they're really essential to it. And, yep. and I'd like to see more of that in the clinical studies, you know, Curanderos have been doing this for a long time. They've learned a thing or two. Yes. You know, and, and clinicians should pay attention to this. Yes, and I, I'm pushing your message, Dennis, I promise. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> there are many documentaries showcasing the incredible healing potential of ayahuasca, and many people with mental illness are claiming life-changing experiences. So I wanted to ask Dennis... What is it about ayahuasca that makes it so powerful? You know, it's it's a very planty medicine, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, it's made from a combination of at least two plants. You know how it works. Mm-hmm. The the vine contains the uh, beta carbolines that's and the the admixture plants contain the DMT, which is the psychedelic component of it. And DMT is not orally active by itself, so. It, uh, it the the beta carbolates inhibit monoamine oxidase in the gut, so it lets DMT be absorbed in the active form. Uh, what the difference between ayahuasca and something like psilocybin or MDMA is? It's much more of a mind body medicine. I mean, it will put your body through changes. Yeah. You know, uh, primarily purgation. You know, in in the Amazon, it's called La Purga, as well as ayahuasca, meaning the purge. And it does stimulate purging. It stimulates uh, throwing up. But this is understood in in the context of the traditional practices. This is not a bad thing. Purging is cleansing. Purging is getting rid of the toxins in your body that – and along with that goes – the idea of getting rid of the the psychic toxins that are mucking things up. So it's not like you take ayahuasca and you're sick for six hours throwing up, Mm -hmm. you know, although that does happen. (laughs) But rarely, (laughs) most most people, you know, a lot of people don't even throw up on ayahuasca. But if you throw up on ayahuasca, you know, and I'm usually one of those that do about two hours into it, I feel like I need to, purge so i do and then i feel much better you know my body feels clean and then i can just settle into the rest of the trip and 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 you know you feel better mdma as a rule does not induce nausea uh and psilocybin mushrooms sometimes do for some people i never see i never am upset uh you know when i take Mushrooms. I rarely have any stomach issues or mm-hmm. feel any nausea. Uh, for people that do, I sometimes suggest, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know how you take mushrooms, but tea is a good way to take it. If you make a hot tea out of it, yeah. And you can put some ginger in that tea, yep. right? Yep. Like ginger tea, and that'll settle your stomach, and that should take care of any issues. Like Works that. like a charm. Yeah, that's exactly how we did it last time. <laughs> well, so there you go. Right. <laughs> Common sense, really. Yeah. Exactly. Really. So I knew Dennis was working on a film to raise awareness that we are losing ancient knowledge of plants and rituals in the Amazon. I wanted to know what was driving the film and what he was looking to achieve. We're working on this thing called biognosis, which means basically bio is biology, gnosis is knowledge. Uh, It's more of a brand concept than anything else. But we're trying to preserve this traditional knowledge that uh, has been, as you say, accumulated over thousands of years 
by these indigenous these indigenous groups about the use of plant medicines in general, not just ayahuasca. And uh, you know, these are not this is not stuff that's written down uh, mm-hmm. as a rule. These people are not they they don't think that way. You know, there are systems of traditional medicine like Chinese medicine or Ayurveda with extensive texts and documentation and materia medicas and so on in the same way Western medicine as well, you know, like the teachings of Dioscorides and all that. Indigenous peoples don't have that orientation. This knowledge is transmitted orally through usually one a pr- one teacher, one curandero will have apprentices and they acquire the knowledge. So it's not a fixed thing. It's a, it's an evolving thing, mm-hmm. you know, and the other aspect of it is essentially, particularly in the Amazon where they, uh, people live in an environment of incredible biodiversity, you know, it's a very experimental kind of thing. You know, shamans are, essentially experimental ethnopharmacologists yep, yep. you know they may produce they may make their basic brews from just a couple of ingredients but there's a whole pharmacopoeia of plants associated with that and they have a practice uh, around the dietas they call the dietas if you're if you're training to become an ayahuascaro, then you have to undergo these dietas with other plants that are not ayahuasca and you use them either with ayahuasca or at different times while you're taking ayahuasca and through the ayahuasca experiences you learn how to use these plants and so this is the uh, kind of knowledge that we're trying to preserve and we're trying to bring that and connect it to science. So bridging ancestral wisdom is the other thing. We're trying to bring ancestral knowledge and scientific knowledge together. Mm-hmm. And so the focus of that for our project has been this one uh, university in Iquitos and this one person there, his name is Juan Ruiz. He is the uh, curator of the herbarium at, at the university. And he is not a curandero, but he has grown up in the area and he knows traditional medicine as well as anybody. He's not a practitioner. What he brings to the table is he has one foot in in traditional knowledge and one foot in scientific knowledge, right? And so he's the curator of this herbarium. So ultimately, we want to digitize this herbarium there. They have about 100,000 specimens and you wow. know, herbarias are libraries of of dry plants, mm-hmm. basically dry mm-hmm. plants collections. So we want to digitize these these collections and put them online, and then make that a resource for people with interest in really any aspect of Amazonian plants. You know, whether whether for medicinal purposes or nutritional or or entirely different things just create uh make that university uh that uh unap herbarium uh you know which now is a fairly third world underfunded kind of thing but but bring it into the 21st century and make it uh, a, a a global resource for amazonian uh ethnobotany that anyone in the world can access online so that's that's the uh, uh, you know that's the ultimate goal, and the mm-hmm. first stage of this is where Greg and and Hemming's house. What we're engaged with right now is to develop a series of documentaries about traditional medicine that looks for different aspects of of the practice, you know, and and we're just finishing up. Or at least we think we're fishing, finishing up <laughs> uh, the the initial short documentary that's going to kind of introduce this concept to the world and hopefully uh, attract support and, and additional funding. This is going to be a long term project, amazing. Uh, but it's it's great work. I'm very happy to be involved and and this is a dream I've had for a long time to do this. You know, that's great. So Dennis recently did a podcast with Tim Ferriss, which we loved. And one of the questions he asked is if he could create a message on a billboard, what would it be? 
Dennis's response was remember to remember. So I asked him what he meant by that. Well, uh, I, I think for me, I mean, what the message that I get from, from ayahuasca uh, is, uh, you know, if I had to condense it into a single, uh, sort of a single aphorism or forever, remember how little you know. You know, th- mm-hmm. this is what I get again and again from ayahuasca. Maybe I'm thick skull. Maybe I need to be told that over and over. But I, <laughs> I think that's really important. Remember how little you know. And that implies two things. Number one, there's no excuse for arrogance because effectively we don't know much. You know, we don't really know much. And that's okay because nobody can know everything. And the other side of that coin is, well, we have a lot to learn. Yep. And that's also a good thing, mm-hmm. you know, because I think curiosity and wonder and just just the uh, willingness to, uh, you know, a, a pre- to be surprised and, and you know, is, is a good thing. I mean, you know, there are many, many astonishing things in the world that we can experience all the time, every day, really. And so I think the lesson of ayahuasca is don't don't be afraid to be amazed. This is actually a pretty marvelous world that we live in. But don't lose sight of the fact that you don't know shit. Basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? I never don't lose sight of that. Use that word. We can bleep that, but you know, but but that's that's it. That, yeah. that's it basically. And I think. Uh, you know, and I think that's why ayahuasca and psychedelics in general are very useful uh, learning tools uh, for scientists, for example. You know, because scientists, uh, I think especially, are prone to think that, you know, they're pretty hot, that they have it all figured out, you know, and that, and that there's just a few things to be mopped up and we'll have this whole reality thing figured out ayahuasca just blows that apart and and says you know you uh, as a species we understand a tiny 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 slice of reality Mm -hmm. you know and we don't even understand that very well you know this is the way that science works but but scientists tend to be kind of arrogant and i think that's i think that's an impediment to good science Mm. you know Uh, you have to be open-minded and theoretically, this is the way, you know, properly pursued, that's the way science works. You know, you, you try to understand nature, you develop hypotheses, you test the hypothesis, and maybe you have to throw it out the window, you know, yep. and come up, either modify it or come up with a better one or a different one. That is the practice of science. That's how it moves forward. You know, but in this world, science is also not cannot be separated from, you know, academics and funding and prestige and the whole, you know, big science infrastructure. So people do get tend they do tend to get their, you know, cling to their ideas and, and it reduces their flexibility because you have to be willing to admit that you were wrong, you know, mm-hmm. that you just did not have it right. And then you can move on to, uh, you know, to make better discoveries. And there's something also about about psychedelics that I think uh, uh, is is relevant. That's interesting in this context, which is that uh, psychedelics themselves uh, are scientific instruments. You know, they can be used as scientific instruments as a way to look at natural processes in a novel way. This has, again, uh, uh, goes back to being able to step out of your customary reference frame. Mm -hmm. So uh, a a lot of science is observation and understanding processes. If you can look at processes from a fresh perspective, you know, you get a, you get better insights to it. And and this has been proven time and again, Uh, many well, not many, but a few scientists, shall we say, have had the courage to admit in public that uh, some of their insights 
uh, whether it be mathematics or physics or biology or whatever, came uh, the inspirations and the insights came from their psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. Even uh, uh, Crick, James, uh, James was it Watson and Crick? Anyway, that one of the guys that discovered DNA, uh, which was a collective uh, a collective effort, mm -hmm. uh, finally admitted close to his deathbed that yes, LSD had been useful to help him understand uh, the double helix and all that. Of course. Had to be on his deathbed, didn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> cool. What a great lesson we can all take away. I've always been wary of people who think they know it all. The more curious we are, the more we can grow, but we have to be okay with not having all the answers. No, I completely agree. And the more we grow, the better we can be. Now, here's something I get asked about a lot. Does microdosing work? And is it just as effective as a therapeutic dose? I've microdosed off and on over the last few years, but I've never really seemed to get much benefit from it. I definitely prefer a therapeutic dose, and it provides me with a valuable lesson every single time. I'm kind of a skeptic on microdosing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I... But the thing is, there haven't been any good studies that have settled this issue, okay. you know. So what you have is personal reports, you know, anecdote. Yep. Uh, uh, if you wanted to give it a more respectable sounding uh, term, you could call it a case study. Okay. I think that microdosing may work for some people. Uh, but it's very hard to tell the micro, the actual effect from placebo, you know, and mm -hmm. placebo has an effect as well. And the only study I've seen, which is not really a very good study because it was based on online questionnaires and, mm -hmm. and you know, hardly a controlled study. But yep. the results were that uh, in the study, people who microdosed had a benefit they, as far as depression was concerned, they, they did significantly, uh, uh, you know, had a significant effect on depression. Problem is, so did the placebo. Group. Yeah. yeah, okay. And this comes up all the time because yeah. the placebo group, the placebo effect is, is a real effect, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's conditioned by expectations and this sort of thing. I mean, there's other studies very similar, actually, that show that you can't sort out. It's uh, at these low doses, you can't sort out the difference between the actual drug effect and the placebo effect. These things are very hard to to parse out in terms of how you're going to look at it statistically. You mm -hmm. know, uh, so I feel like uh, it's again, it's a personal choice. I think if people feel like they're you know, that they benefit from microdosing, go for it. Yep. I mean, it's it's not going to hurt them. Yep. On the other hand, don't forget that just a few milligrams away is a world of wonder. That's right. <laughs> and they should not, you know, and they should visit that once in a while. You yep. know, they should not use microdosing as an excuse to not take effective doses of psychedelics yep. frankly I, agree. I mean i think i think that people should should step you know out of out of the reference frame once in a while and and take you know blow out the gaskets if you if you will yep. and uh and then you know i think that i think that microdosing may be effective may be helpful after one of those experiences to to kind of follow up, you yeah. know, to kind of keep that antidepressant effect going or that, you know, anti-traumatic effect going. But mm, yeah. it's really important not to assume that, you know, that microdosing is all is all that's needed. Yeah, I, don't, and, I don't agree with that. No, me either. And I, and I do that exact same thing is I microdose and then I take my, my medicine when I, when I need to. Yeah. And I find it and, works and, well. And, if you feel like it's beneficial, why not? I mean, yep. there's, there's no reason why not. It may be placebo effect, but who cares? The Absolutely. point is there is an effect. Yep. You know, there's a perceived benefit and only you can 
really be the judge of that. So Amy, just before COVID hit, do you remember we were thinking of heading to, to a retreat hosted by Dennis's team in the Sacred Valley of Peru? How could I not? I was the one planning it. Well, they haven't hosted one since, and I asked them if they had any plans to get back on track. Well, yeah, aspirationally, uh, we would like to to get back to doing retreats, uh, and uh, that's really what the McKenna Academy grew out of in the sense that Christina, the executive director, and, and myself had been doing retreats in the Sacred Valley since about 2012, you know, and we would bring groups down there and we would do these ayahuasca retreats, which were really marvelous, you know, and, and people had a lot of benefits. Uh, Doing them in the Sacred Valley was a, was a great place to do it because you're in the heart of the Andean medicine traditions. Well, ayahuasca is, is Amazonian, but you know, it was also used in the Andes but the thing is, you have this this sort of cultural, uh, you know, bubble in a sense that you're in in the traditional culture, and and so the way we used to run the retreats, what what worked for us would we do a ten day retreat, and everyone would meet in Cusco, and we'd basically play tourist for about three days, and we'd visit all these archaeological sites. We had wonderful guides that go to Machu Picchu and Saxi Waiman and all these different archaeological sites. So that created a real bonding experience for the people. You know, you, you, in the first morning of the session, you're in the lobby of the hotel in, in Cusco and you're looking around at all these strangers and you say, geez, I paid all this money to come down here and throw up with these people. <laughs> You know, but by the time you get through this this experience, everybody's friends, and it yep. creates a beautiful dynamic. Yep. So then, when we did get back to the retreat center and and for the next seven days do the sessions, then everyone was ready to support each other and go through this experience with each other. And uh, so it was really good a good dynamic. And we, we we normally the way we used to do it, we'd do three three retreat, three ayahuasca sessions every other day in the last seven days. So we had a day between each session to integrate, talk about it, effectively group therapy. Nice. And then people could go through their process. I saw wonderful benefits, you know, for people. Uh, we're, we're not, uh, you know, we're not claiming to be therapists. We're not therapists. So we're not saying this is going to fix your depression or your trauma or whatever, but just that we'll, we're creating a space where you can work on whatever it is that you came here for. A you personal know? foundation. And, and you, you bring it with you and, uh, we create optimal, uh, you know, circumstances where you can have these deep experiences. The curandero is there to uh, to help, and and your fellow travelers are there to help. So it works very well, and I feel like people, you know, and we've had many vets. Some of the people from Heroic Arts and and other vets that are, you know, not even affiliated with those groups, but they came down for healing for a lot of their trauma and i've seen you know incredible benefits so that's the uh that was the very satisfying part of it you know to be able to uh make these experiences available to people in in the right setting yeah well we certainly would like to go down so we're hoping that they get back on track (laughs) yes well we're 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 hoping to you know covid has thrown everything into into uncertainty. But I think later on this year, we'll be able to do at least one retreat, maybe two before the year is out. We just don't know, you know, uh, but we would, we want to do it. We want to, we want to do it. Absolutely. That's great. Yep. We have to get Greg 
to come to. Well, I, I was just going to He's jump, coming with us. I was going to jump in and say, Dennis, we've already talked about uh, <laughs> premiering our film uh, in yeah. Iquitos, right? So uh, we, we, we could do two things at once. We'll, we'll screen the film and then join you on, a, on one of the, the sessions. Yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. we, do, we do have this conference, yes, in the UK coming up. But that, that will be where we'll screen this trailer. And uh, doubtful that there'll be any... Uh, any ceremonies associated with that. This is kind of a stuffed shirt, button-down type scientific conference, although what's happening off-site, I don't need to know about. (laughs) (laughs) Chances are there'll be some things, but but that's not us. But there are definitely opportunities, you know, even in the UK for this kind of thing. That's great news. I'm really looking forward to getting down to Peru. And Dennis and his team are extremely knowledgeable, and I hope they will continue to offer retreats. It's always interesting listening to Dennis speak, so it's no surprise we had a great time chatting with him. If you're new to the subject of psychedelics being used therapeutically, we hope this podcast has opened your mind on alternative treatments. It's important to do your research and work with experienced professionals. If you'd like to learn more about Dennis, visit the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy at McKenna.Academy. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to help us out, please subscribe and rate our podcast and share with your friends. We also ask that you pay special attention to veterans, active military members, first responders, and their families, because most of them are suffering alone and in silence. Let's work together to provide some information that may change their lives. This episode was recorded at the Hemmings House Studios with the help of our producer, Greg Hemmings, and edited by Hayden McNamee, and music provided by audionetwork.com. Please follow our Facebook and Instagram pages for links and more episodes. Thank you, and have a great day.